I wish you all a very good morning from the Peterson Student Center on the campus of St. John's College, Santa Fe, New Mexico. My name is Walter Sterling. I'm the Dean of the Santa Fe campus of St. John's. This is our second virtual commencement with live and recorded elements. And if we have any technical difficulties, please give us a few minutes. And if they're not quickly resolved, we will send out information about when and how the full recording can be accessed. On behalf of President Mark Roosevelt, our Board of Visitors and Governors, faculty, staff, and the whole campus and college community, I welcome you all, our liberal arts and Eastern Classics master's students, this class of 2020, friends and family members, and others, to this commencement and celebratory occasion. These are difficult times, and we are, of course, sorry not to have you here with us physically. But that in no way diminishes our pride in what you have accomplished, our desire to congratulate you and honor these accomplishments, and our collective sense of joy, celebration, and inspiration that your commencement offers us today. This is a commencement in full. That said, we do look forward more poignantly than ever, to welcoming you back to our beautiful campus, what is now a new alma mater for you, and will always be another home for you. We will raise a glass today, but we look forward to sitting and talking and celebrating again with you once we can see you all again back on our campus. We breathed a sigh of relief when we made it through our May commencement, but then for us, as for you, it was right back to work and to the classroom. Our college owes a special debt of gratitude to you Graduate Institute students, who together with our January freshmen, were the first students to knowingly begin a term of the college fully online. You have been a kind of vanguard, not only in demonstrating perseverance through these challenges, but also in establishing how remarkably well our shared work of the classroom and our shared conversation and friendship as the community of learning we are can survive and thrive through change, through adversity. You have helped us to learn how best to continue the conversation, given us added confidence and resolve, and offered us inspiration for the work of the whole college community moving forward and we are grateful. You will always be a special class marked by these accomplishments. I will return at the end to offer another brief word of congratulations, but now let me introduce my friend and colleague, tutor and associate dean for graduate programs, Ned Walton. Welcome. I am extremely happy to preside over the 54th commencement of the Santa Fe campus in the 324th year of the college. At this time, I am proud to present the awards and prizes. For his Chinese translation, the William A. Darkey Prize for the best translation goes to John Martinez for Spending the Night in the Mountain Temple by Li Bai, and for her Graduate Institute Liberal Arts Preceptorial paper, Philippa Scott, for Richard II, to sympathize or not to sympathize, that is the question. Congratulations to you both. And now I'd like to introduce our commencement speaker, Carrie Stickney has been a tutor on the Santa Fe campus since 1980, and he served as the director of the Graduate Institute from 1994 to 1997. Mr. Stickney believes that studying German and philosophy in Germany for three years after he graduated from St. John's College Annapolis was formative. Even more important, about that time, for him, was meeting his future wife, tutor Susan Stickney. He was convinced she was the one for him 
when he heard her exclaim that anything worth doing was worth doing badly. He claims he has lived his life according to that maxim. It is only appropriate that we honor Mr. Stickney's retirement as well as, well as all of your graduations with an address by him. Mr. Stickney. Good morning and welcome to one and all. Special welcome and congratulations to all the graduates. I thank you for finding us and for coming to us and for giving yourselves to our common project so generously and successfully. I would like for your parting gift from us to be a few happy memories that you will keep with you. So it will be a gift you already possess and my giving will really only be a reminding. What are the things you most want to remember from your time here? I can only make an educated guess, quite apart from what you wish, perhaps. Perhaps you do not yet yourselves know what will in fact remain to you of this experience five or 10 years or a lifetime from now. Some will surely be what you choose to remember, and some for better or for worse, may be what you cannot forget. And the two may be mingled. A seminar is named after seeds, and some seeds take a long time to germinate and grow. So I will try to ask a few compact and seed-like questions. Will you remember a growing courage and confidence in your powers of learning and understanding? Do you remember the first time you thought, this peculiar old book is making a surprising amount of sense to me? Did it happen when you tried to write about what you had read and discussed? I hope it came with a sense that learning is so delightful a process as to be worth any risk of seeming ignorant while you do it. For Socrates is right to say, we cannot learn when we are sure we already know, but also that we cannot learn what we do not in some strange way already know. And Dogen too, when he says, you cannot put a fish in the water or a bird in the sky. That is, I hope your courage stays with you as a conviction that learning, however difficult, is our calling as human beings. A young woman undergraduate told me some years ago that the strangest and most enlivening part about learning is to be in the presence of something you don't understand with the expectation that at some undetermined time, not really up to you, you will. Sometimes at the moment, you can't fully believe that you will. Sometimes you may be almost sure that you will never understand this or that. But the subsequent feeling of freedom and growth is all the more intense when the moment comes that you do begin to understand. Courage and patience come together in that moment, along with the readiness to accept help. Simone Weil compares such learning to prayer. I want to call it an acknowledgement of poverty that becomes wealth. The things of friends are in common, and so we share this poverty and this wealth. Socrates says, what I know is that I don't know. Dogen says, the worst student is the best student. And what, after all, is the object of our common fear? Our own and other people's judgment that we are limited or incapable? This is a frightening judgment because it is true. We are all limited and needy. We are not each sufficient unto ourselves. Yet with one another's help, we do sometimes learn Maybe we must linger with our fear a little longer. Do you remember gaining confidence 
in the power of asking out loud your own honest questions? All such questions are ways of facing what we don't yet understand. Did that confidence come with a growing appreciation of how your classmates' questions could sometimes become real keys to open up a reading for you? It sounds as if I'm asking about memories of becoming courageous in a certain way. It takes courage to ask a question that you strongly suspect is based on a faulty understanding of what you were questioning, as it takes courage to go forward in the dark in spite of fears for your own safety. In the latter situation, it seems the worst outcome would be to sustain some irreparable damage, worst of all, to lose one's life. In the former, what we fear is harder to name, is it a crippling discovery, all the more humiliating for being public, that there are some beautiful and valuable things for which we have no capacity at all? It is not so hard to try and fail in the confidence that enough repeated trying will surely eventually bring success. It may be that beautiful things are difficult, as an old Greek saying puts it, but what if for me now, Beautiful things are impossible. How do we summon our courage when things seem impossible? Is it enough to remember that we are always already in the zone between ignorance and knowledge, a realm of opinion where we can say or think nothing that is not partly right and partly wrong? This can help, I think, and I want to return to it but are we not also helped like the soldier facing danger by the presence of friends who share the risks and rewards of the attempt to think new thoughts? These comrades include the living and the dead. There are those around us who help us moment by moment in the conversation and those whose record of their thoughts provides some guideposts on the mountain we climb together. Friends strengthen our courage. I hope you will remember friends, living and dead, from your time here. As with those difficult old books, the people we speak with here may have most to teach us just where they least fit our expectations. And we come to respect them for precisely that, even to be grateful for it. Especially as we see that this is you not me, unique to people here. Do not imagine you have had your last seminar simply because you are leaving this place and these people. When you take on some job you never thought you could and then succeed at it, you will likely be using things you may not even have known you were learning in our classrooms or our Zoom rooms about how to listen, how to speak, how to begin to be a friend by confessing ignorance, sharing questions, by leading or following as the conversation may require in its changes and growth. We start our seminar discussions with a so-called opening question. Questions at their best are full of opening, flowering activity, full of life like a sprouting seed. Answers, by contrast, seem less, seem less lively. Answers often attain a kind of safety, but if the price is closing off any further questions, then it is too high. One path back from dead-end answers is remembering that a living question is not a mere problem to be solved once and for all and then safely forgotten. I could call this a memory of becoming readier to fail if success were to be imagined to be the same as answering all questions. Keats talks about negative capability, a power to go forward in dark places without, quote, irritable reaching after facts, unquote. It sounds like the ability to let a question keep on being a question. Readiness to fail may not be strong enough. Let us take the bull by the horns and call it the readiness to add mistake 
to mistake. Eastern Classics graduates may hear something familiar here. I'm quoting Dogen, the Japanese Zen Buddhist, again, and his striking Chinese phrase, Shoshaku Jushaku. It is sometimes loosely translated, a life that is one continuous mistake. When it begins to dawn on us there, that there could be such a thing as enlightenment, as finding ourselves in full harmony with all that is, and dwelling in that unity, without thereby ceasing to be the finite and transitory shadows that we are, that indeed every finite thing is. When I say this possibility dawns on us so that we can actually long for such enlightenment, then its corollary arrives simultaneously, that we are always failing to achieve this. Our discontent with our present deluded condition is both necessary in order that we go on seeking and itself a symptom of delusion for truly to be enlightened would mean accepting fully our never fully enlightened selves. It is this paradox in which the problem somehow reappears as its own solution that seems to be in the hope seems to be the hope inside that phrase about the life that is one continual mistake. And I submit that you have all achieved this kind of enlightenment in your time in tutorials and preceptorials and seminars at St. John's. It is a common experience that we enter conversation most often with classmates or the books because something we are hearing from them or remembering from the text did not after all seem quite right to us. We rarely know exactly where it fell short, but we launch into speech to understand why we seem to see something more or different. Even as we hear ourselves speak, we realize that we have not quite gotten it right either. And we may see that we have been led to a bigger difficulty than the one we saw precisely by our attempt to correct that objectionable bit. Almost certainly, one of our fellow learners will see that and begin often with sincere gratitude for our help to point it out to us. And so it goes. Each thought seeks completion and reveals its own lack, even as it somehow encourages continuing efforts to see more clearly and speak better. This is the conversation that is one continuous mistake. What is that encouragement and gratitude we feel at moments in a successful conversation? The pleasure of arriving at a new insight, small though it be? I am willing to call it a glimpse of enlightenment. Socrates speaks of a personal daimon that keeps him from saying or doing things that would be wrong. Some have suggested he is describing conscience, a fragment of divinity in each of us. I want to think it may be the encounter with our freedom from every limited view, our capability to imagine going beyond any finite thought or thing. This is our misery and our glory. Conversation has no natural end. Socrates often returns as if conscience stricken to earlier conclusions and offers possible refutations or turns them upside down. Sometimes he purports to have shown two things to be true, which are clearly mutually exclusive. The Zen masters sometimes seem to be engaging in a kind of endless combat or effort to outdo one another's degree of enlightenment, often concluding their head-cutting exchanges with blows or shouts what then is enlightenment? A mirror completely free of dust? But where could any dust come from? But where could the mirror come from? Come a little closer and I'll show you where. Slap. This last is likely to be followed by a respectful bow or perhaps a slap in return. When we learn anything, 
anything at all, from how to tie a new knot to how to recognize a verb form in a foreign language, we encounter our freedom to change and we see the world change. It is perhaps a little thing, like a seed, and perhaps only makes a little change, but it is a glimpse of enlightenment, of the divine within and without. You have seen it, all of you have, and you will not forget it. I bow to you. I, the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs at the Graduate Institute in Liberal Education of St. John's College in Santa Fe, bear witness that these individuals have applied themselves among us to a program of study in the Graduate Institute, and that they have successfully completed the program in Liberal Arts or the program in Eastern Classics. Master of Arts in Eastern Classics. Brianna Destiny Alexis Briley, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Roxy Kaywood, Adams, Tennessee. Jillian Patricia Cowley, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Brittany Jean Hagar, Minot, North Dakota. Reese Stewart Jenkins, Erie, Colorado. Timothy Patrick McGuire, Catonsville, Maryland. Christopher William Rice, Lawrence, Kansas. Michael Everett Van Wee, Jr., Mechanicsville, Maryland. Chaya Venkata Krishnaya, Bangalore, India. Master of Arts in Liberal Arts. Charlene Elizabeth Diaz, Wichita, Kansas. Gabriel Gleis Monar, Evanston, Illinois. On behalf of the Alumni Association, we want to welcome you as our newest alumni. Well welcome. <laughs> we continue now with the charge to the Master of Arts candidates. We, the Dean and the tutors of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, bear witness that these students have applied themselves among us to the program of studies in the Graduate Institute of Liberal Education, that they have successfully completed that program in the Eastern Classics and Liberal Arts. And finally, that in this public session on this seventh day of August, 2020, they have reached the degree of Master of Arts in Eastern Classics and Master of Arts in Liberal Arts. In witness of this, we have, on this aforesaid day and year, subscribed our names to these letters, which have been confirmed by the great seal of the college. By command of the Board of Visitors and Governors of St. John's College, I admit you to the degree of Master of Arts in Eastern Classics and Master of Arts in Liberal Arts. Now I invite Mr. Walpin to begin our toast.
and now a toast. I feel doubly in a bind. Here I am, an older tutor, but a new dean of the Graduate Institute, and I couldn't even spend the summer getting to know you all. So I do want to toast you and commend you for your extraordinary perseverance. I have taught both in the LA and the EC, and I know how challenging and life-changing those programs are. What you have accomplished is truly impressive and worth celebrating. But I want you to have a toast from someone you all know. And so I've dragged him out of his retirement to toast you, David McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Walton. It's good to be here with you, to congratulate you. You know these have been hard months. The world, the nation, and the college have been brought to sharp awareness of the fact of human suffering. Now, whether you've been studying Eastern texts or Western texts, you've seen that suffering is always a topic for any serious view of life. And each of us is personally confronted with pain and sorrow. This brings me to you and your educatedness. What's it for, education? Why should you take on added struggle of heart and mind, hours of reading and mental labor, hours of listening, thinking, speaking? Here's part of an answer. To become educated is to become more serious. And to be serious, I might define it this way, is to be open to the possibility of meaning. And to be alert to meaning is to have a foothold with regard to suffering, a way of being steady, a way to prevail. Joy is not unserious. Delight is not unserious. What is unserious is nihilism, the habitual indifference to meaning. We're all liable to it, especially in this age. To emerge from such indifference, we become educated. Along the way, we find the exhilaration of a mind lit up by significance. I saw your delight. I saw your joy. I had the honor of being in the Graduate Institute classroom where there are serious people. It's not the seriousness of mere book learning, but of taking things to heart over and over in a discipline of intelligent love toward the entirety of being human. I will not cease to admire you, you students of St. John's, for this brave and benevolent work of seriousness that you undertook. May your seriousness bring sunlight into your own lives and into the lives around you. May there be illumination even in hard times. May you find seriousness to be a close companion to happiness. I am so pleased to be back with you now to congratulate you and to wish you a very serious future. Now Dean Sterling will offer a final word. Thank you, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Walpin, Mr. Stickney. Thank you for your eloquent words. I also want to thank all the faculty and staff and others that have helped to make this ceremony possible today. And thanks to all of you uh, for joining us today. I join in commending you once again on your accomplishments. Uh, this will be our final word. And if you haven't done so yet, you could consider throwing a hat, but don't break anything or, or hurt anybody. Congratulations to the Graduate Institute Summer Class of 2020. <laughs>